Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hi, Thriving Farmers. Michael Kilpatrick here, yet with another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today my guest is Abram J. Bixler, PhD, who is president and CEO of ECHO, a global Christian organization focused on empowering the undernourished through sustainable hunger solutions. With over 15 years of international experience, Abram leads the charge to help foster sustainable agricultural practices and holistic missions worldwide. Abram, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here and uh, welcome to all your listeners. Absolutely. So give us a little bit of background is uh, what did you start out your career with? Uh, that's a great question. Going back a little bit into the archives. Uh, yes, my background is really environmental science and biology and really the uh, the application of ecology to looking at not only agricultural production systems, but also later on to food systems. So um, I went to university wanting to learn about environmental science, utilize environmental science, and I mean, it's a, that's a great topic. If any of your listeners are trying to figure out what to do with their lives, especially you know academically, environmental science is really the study of people and the planet and their interactions. So the living, the non-living, how they all function together. Um, it, it's a bit depressing, but it's also filled with hope. And really, we see that through agriculture, one of the biggest drivers of some of our most pressing challenges like climate change and freshwater withdrawal, as well as soil erosion and loss, are driven to a large extent by agriculture and poor agriculture. But there's also so much hope that agriculture can provide through sustainable practices to improve people's lives and also the planet. And so that's what I w- went to school doing. I ended up in graduate school after having visited ECHO for two months in between undergrad and grad school. Ended up studying sustainable agriculture, community development, best practices, especially in the developing world. And then um, really felt called, my wife and I felt called to use our skills internationally and uh, ended up teaching at a study abroad school in Chiang Mai, Thailand, about sustainable development, and in particular, sustainable food systems of northern Thailand. And that one thing led to another, and I became the director of the Echo Asia Impact Center based in Chiang Mai, and so I was there for a total of nine years. And that led me into just the intricacies and, the pro- and just the complex problems that we have with food and um, our food systems and the interaction of people on the planet. And um, eventually I ended up with the United Nations working for the Food and Agriculture Organization on the agroecology team. So helping countries and other actors try to design and manage sustainable food systems using the principles of ecology before I came back to ECHO for the third time about a year and a half ago as the president and CEO. Very cool. So talk us through a little bit about working with government agencies and that sort of thing with your, your, your time there. Yeah, that was, that was fascinating at FAO. So I, I come from the academic but also the not-for-profit NGO, the non-governmental organization world. And so that was the beginning of my career was really academia and then study abroad, experiential education, working with farmers, working with other not-for-profits, really at the grassroots level. And I saw change happening, you know, farmer to farmer. I saw the good work that NGOs were doing around the world, that grassroots leaders and organizations were doing. But it wasn't until I got to the United Nations where I saw just the real need for policy change as well. Um, And so my time at FAO was spent providing both technical and policy advice to countries who requested assistance from the specialized agency of the United Nations working in food systems, which is which is FAO. And I really began to see, you know, through my through my prior career, I saw the the change and the importance that one farmer adopting more sustainable practices, improve livelihoods, improve profitability 
could really have, but I also saw the limits to that and how policy was so important to help scale up and scale out the good stuff, but it could also, if it was misdirected or there are unintended consequences, which often happens, um, that, that could really become a, a disabling factor to, to real sustainability. And so that was really eye-opening. I came to really appreciate the need for both, you know, individual farmers, the, the work that's happening through grassroots efforts for sustainable agriculture around the world, and then the need with proper subsidies and governments addressing vulnerabilities with a long-term plan of, you know, how do you use policy wisely in, in really small ways to try to get bigger um, beneficial outcomes from those. So yeah, fascinating time. Interesting. And I'm assuming that a large part of what they do is just give aid, but you were working on the food system. So, you know, what percentage of their budget goes towards that side of things? Yeah. So, well, an interesting thing about the food and agriculture organization is that um, they're, they're a specialized agency of the United Nations, one of the bigger ones. At the time I was working there, there were about 13,000 employees. And um, there are some emergency relief efforts that they're doing, but the majority of their work is really uh, creating tools, so normative tools that those are tools to help evaluate, measure, um, and, and set good policy. So they're working a lot on normative tools, they're working a lot in actual implementation of projects with countries, as well as providing policy guidance and advice. So I think. When you think about, when we think, when I think about food and agricultural systems, I often think about the crops, but really food systems go s so much beyond that. They go, you know, it touches on fisheries and global management of fisheries and wise use of, of those resources, forests, because so many people rely on forest products for not only the food aspect, but also the timber and the building materials. Uh, food systems also touch on Fiber, so cotton, the cotton and the clothes we wear come from food systems and agricultural systems, and then also fuel, fuel systems. So, uh, you know, the FAO is really working in all of these really diverse domains. You had animals in terms of livestock, plants in terms of crop. You had markets and gender specialists and fisheries and freshwater and bioeconomy, and I could go on and on and on. And so... One of the other things I came to appreciate was that whereas, you know, the World Food Program, which would be a sister agency, okay. is more on the food distribution, FAO is really trying to tackle these really messy, complex, um, problem-filled systems um, from that level. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. So let's go back to your time at Echo when you were over in Asia. Talk to us what kind of your role there ended up being and kind of what was your day-to-day -day like? Yeah, um, it was it was a job I, I tremendously enjoyed and loved. I had the had the benefit of moving to Thailand. So I said, you know, for those first four years, we were uh, I was a teacher at a study abroad school. Well, I moved to Thailand right as Echo, which is based in Fort Myers, Florida, and is 42 years old. For the first time ever in their history, was just starting an international presence. So back in 2009, they started the first regional impact center almost the exact same month that my wife and I arrived teaching at a study abroad school. And um, because they were starting, I had a PhD in sustainable agriculture and development. I was able to volunteer for four years with that upstart under an incredible director who was a, a visionary and saw what the needs were. And so I stepped into the directorship. And what that entailed was I oversaw and led a team at the time of about seven people it, that were really building a network of practitioners, farmers, NGO workers, grassroots leaders throughout the Asia region who were looking for um, really innovative but low cost and, and practical innovations that could work in, in Asia to help improve food security, reduce, reduce hunger, improve livelihoods through sustainable agriculture. And so we would we would work electronically supporting and curating different ideas and strategies that our network would be interested in. We would do a lot of trainings in Thailand 
for the region as well as with network partners throughout the region. Uh, we would offer a lot of tours and trainings, publications in, in up to seven different languages. So you can think of us as kind of, if, if your listeners are familiar with the U.S. extension system, whereby extension, primarily county by county, takes the latest research from the Absolutely. universities yep. and really gets it into the hands of the farmers who need it. You can think of us as kind of the global tropical, subtropical agriculture extension agents of the world, getting it into the hands of a, of a super diverse network of individuals in, in all the regions in which we work now. Gotcha. So then let's say Echo, which is based in Florida, are they doing a lot of the research there and then kind of going all over the world with it? Or are you still doing research that's actually um, regional as well? Uh, we're doing a little bit of both. So we, we now fast forward. So Echo started in 1981 here in Fort Myers. And this was the really center of the technical networking research disseminating universe up until 2009 at which point Echo Asia for the region was started in Thailand. Um, and then in 2012, Echo East Africa based in Tanzania for that region was started. And 2013, Echo West Africa based in Burkina Faso was started. Uh, this campus, so we have four offices around the world. Uh, this campus has a North America English speaking regional audience here in Fort Myers, but it also has a lot of the, um, the global support needed. So from this campus, we do a lot of coordinating of globally interesting research projects at the centers, but also with, with other researchers. And then each regional impact center in order to, uh, they're the ones that know the, the needs of, of the farmers in the region. They're the ones that also see what are the upcoming innovations and kind of market dynamics and policies happening. So they do a lot of their own research where there's the capacity with support from from Echo here in, in Fort Myers. So it's, yeah, it's a little bit of both. Um, and I think it keeps us really synergized and it builds capacity, it strengthens existing capacity. And, um, you know, the world of agriculture changes so quickly. Farmers are, they're constantly thinking about the next, next cropping cycle. And, you know, in parts of the tropics, that's three times a year. And so having those local presences is so essential to stay relevant and, find the new innovations, validate those innovations, disseminate those, and, and really measure and see if they're making a, a difference in people's lives. Gotcha. So let's move a little bit to the farmers that you serve. What are some of those problems facing the smallholder farmers around the world? Mm -hmm. Well, one, one thing I think would be pretty, pretty typical of the, you know, the demographics of these farmers would be that uh, for the most part, they are smallholders, so they would, and smallholding is kind of a misnomer. They may or may not actually own their land, but they would be working on five acres or less. Typically, they would be in the, the tropics, subtropics, although not necessarily. Um, typically, their farms would be somewhat diverse or maybe transitioning from a monoculture into a more diverse farming system. Um, typically they wouldn't have a lot of access to inputs like fertilizer or pesticides or, um, or, or machinery. Some may, some, some may not. And so uh, those are the demographics. Uh, another set of farmers we'd work with is that most would be growing some sort of forage or crop or perennials, fuel wood in a diverse system, but we also work a lot with, um, Pastoralists, so those who are raising animals, they may be nomadic as well. So uh, the world's a, a diverse place, but you know some common common themes that emerge in terms of these farmers and their needs. One would be in in a place like Asia, for instance, where you know there's still subsistence farmers. There's still tremendous numbers of subsistence farmers. Those are farmers growing food for themselves and their families and their communities first and, and maybe selling to the market. And other places like Southeast Asia, like Thailand, Cambodia, uh, Vietnam, uh, one of the big concerns is markets and market access. And 
how can farmers add value to their own crop? Probably things that, you know, the people in your network, Michael, are also dealing with. How do you, how do you go from raising yellow number two dent corn and selling it just as every other yellow number two dent corn goes to a grain bin and then is turned into a uh, animal feed or an oil or whatnot. How can you add value to that? How can you capture more of the market? So that's a big theme we see all around the world is the need for value addition, the need for uh, better marketing, market access. Uh, some of the other ones include how can, how can farmers, instead of buying pesticides, which have environmental consequences, human health consequences, um, food safety consequences, how can they create their own um, farm-made you know, farm pesticides or farm-created fertilizers, which you know, would be made from plants or, or animal manure and byproducts, value-added, but it also saves farmers money in the long run. So that's a big need. Another one is um, for creative and efficient use of water. The, the uncertainties with climate change and water availability are, are just raging throughout agriculturalist lives all around the world, whether you're in West Africa or in the, the Americas. Um, how can we make better use of water, store water, especially in the rainy season to then use in the dry season? And that also ties into things like if you're able to store water and use water from the rainy season into the dry season, then does that give you the upper hand in terms of being able to, to grow high value addition crops like healthy, nutritious vegetables when maybe other farmers aren't, aren't providing those sorts of things? Absolutely. And what kind of some of the crops that you're working with? I know some of the crops that have been pushed out there are things like Moringa. So talk us through kind of like where do you see a lot of movement happening right now? Yeah, it's, we love Moringa. Moringa is one of those kind of echo crops. It's actually our logo and um, highly nutritious. Another, another crop that we've seen a lot of merit is that of a perennial vegetable called chaya. And um, there, there are a lot, you know, if you look at the, the world and the number of crops grown in the world, we've really narrowed our... Our, our whole well-being as the human population to about 12 crops that provide the majority of our calories and, and nutrition globally. And um, so we're not trying to compete with those, but we're looking for neglected, underutilized species, NUS, that are underappreciated, underutilized, that have merit, either from a nutritional point of view, from a erosion control point of view, a soil amending um, and building point of view as well. When we can find those crops that do all those things, then that's a, that's a, that's a huge benefit. So Moringa happens to be one of those. Um, we really like perennial vegetables. We think perennial vegetables are underutilized and have tremendous opportunities. And one of the ways that we do that is not only by helping make people aware of different, you know, different uh, neglected and underutilized species uh, that they might even have, or, or reintroduce, but helping helping farmers all around the world to think about, could there be a market for these? Is there a market, especially with the changing rural-urban dynamics, and as people move to cities and sometimes uh, look back and want those staple indigenous or traditional um, crops, is there a way to provide those? But another way that we do that is by seed banking. So Echo, from the beginning, has had a seed bank, and we're not seed distributors or seed vendors, but we provide trial samples of seed to our network when it's appropriate and may make sense for network members to try um, different types of, you know, vegetables, different varieties of plants that might grow well in their conditions, highly nutritious perennial vegetables like Moringa, for instance, or Chaya. And increasingly, we are building the capacity of our network to create, manage um, their own seed banks as well because we see a huge need for helping to prevent local biodiversity loss. We see a huge need for farmers having access to low-cost, better ways to store their seed year in and year out through the growing seasons as well. Gotcha. Now talk to me a little bit about this chaya that you were saying. Is that a, a small seed? 
So China is really interesting, and um, one of the things that makes it so beautiful, uh, literally it is a beautiful plant, it is a perennial vegetable that is an understory species in the rainforest around Yucatan and Belize in, in Central America. And um, usually in the wild, chaya is a, it's a, it's a nice shrubby plant. It has very green leaves. It looks similar to um, kind of a leafy cassava. And, but in the wild, chaya typically ha is covered with these irritating spines. They're not thorns like on a rose bush, but they're, they're spines like on um, stinging nettle. Some of your, okay. some of your listeners yep. might have encountered stinging nettle. It's nasty. Chaya is similar. It's, it has a latex sap to it, but it's a superfood. It's loaded with nutrients. Um, one of the problems with chaya is it's also loaded with cyanide. So it's similar to cassava leaves um, in that regard. Cassava leaves are edible, but they're, they're loaded with cyanide. So you need to boil, boil cassava mm. leaves. Yeah. Um, so one thing that's great about chaya is that it doesn't readily set flower or seeds. We very rarely, if ever, have seen chaya set seeds. So it's easily propagated asexually. You can literally break off a kind of a semi-woody stem of chaya, stick it in the ground during the rainy season. It will root and you will have propagated the plant, um, which means it doesn't become a weedy problem. Whereas some plants, you know, are terrible because of Correct. the seeds they produce. Chaya yes. stays put. It's a nice looking perennial. Um, it's easy to harvest. You can just coppice it. You know, you just cut it back. Um, anytime you want fresh leaves and shoots, you can harvest the fresh tender shoots and leaves, boil them, and that removes the cyanide. What you're left with is a spinach-like, highly nutritious leafy vegetable. And um, we've promoted this all over the world. And the cultures where it, it really does best are in those cultures that are already eating similar leafy plants like, like um, cassava leaves. They Correct. know cassava has cyanide. They're healthy for you, but you need to boil them. Places in throughout Asia, West Africa, East Africa, and Central America, we see a tremendous uptake in chaya. And it's also very pest and disease free. So it's pretty amazing, um, highly nutritious, easy to grow plant that has tremendous impact on, on people's people's health and nutritious nutrition. What we need are more, you know, we need more partners to help us do research, do randomized controlled trials on the effects of chaya in diets. Um, and, you know, that's, I think, the important thing about our network is finding researchers, finding nutritionists who can actually apply for funding and do, you know, really good randomized control trials um, with, with, as appropriate, with human subjects and, and map out their nutrition and look for, are there other ways to prepare chaya that reduces the cyanide that doesn't take as long to boil, for instance. So you cut down on fuel, fuel wood usage in that, in that regard. So it's all connected, um, Michael, you know, even this idea of having to boil chaya, in most places that means you're going to use fuel wood or biomass, which then you're competing, you know, against environmental sustainability. So um, it's all connected, energy, water, food, um, it's all connected, and I think we need to talk about systems as such. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, systems are so key. I know that you know organic matter in the soil is such an important aspect, and that the problem with many of the more temperate environments or tropical environments is because of the high turnover in the soil. It's just it burns through organic matter so quickly. What are some of the ways that you guys are helping farmers address that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a multitude of ways. One would be for more perennial cropping systems like agroforestry, uh, which is the you know the use of perennial trees and perennial plants uh, as actual food, fiber, fuel species, which which tend to hold on to those nutrients and energy cycles much better. Another one is through the usage of green manure cover crops. And these have become really popular in the US and in Europe through uh, practices like regenerative agriculture. We have diverse cover cropping species. Uh, cover crops are not new to the tropics, but there are different types of, of cover crops that grow better in different, different places. So we have worked a lot in cover cropping. Um, in many places of the world, you know, in Asia where I was, one of the starting points is just 
encouraging people not to burn their fields, keeping the organic matter on the fields, using the rice straw or the maize straw on the fields and not burning it. There's, you know, mm-hmm. there's a real cultural component of agriculture as well that um, not only from the cuisine, but also from the practices point of view. And so that's one of the starting points is just helping farmers see residue not as something that's messy or needs to be cleaned up, but as something to hold the soil in place, improve soil moisture, improve uh, weed suppression. But, you know, there's always trade, trade-offs to those. So you might get cooler soil temperatures that take longer for your seeds to germinate. Um, but that's one thing that we're promoting. And it's in addition to agreement or cover crops, contour farming, conservation agriculture. So our teams in West Africa have had tremendous uptake of a technique called farming God's way. Foundations for farming is another term. It basically just says that leave the soil covered at all times, use planting stations. So dig pits. So many parts of West Africa, people plant by hand, Mm. dig pits, create your own compost. Instead of composting and, and adding that to the entire field, Put the put the fo- the compost in a focused manner inside the pits where your root zone is. Cover your soil. Keep the erosion down through that. Leave your residue in place. Plant on time. Plant in a timely manner. Plant in a very precise way so that each year you can go back, open the pit up, add more compost to the pit. So it has the effect of, of holding your soil in place, holding soil moisture in place suppressing weeds and improving yields. So uh, that's just one example of some of the options and strategies Mm. we're seeing around the world. Yeah, that is so interesting because obviously if you try to add a little bit of compost to an entire field, frequently you actually get nowhere because it's not enough to do any uh, change. But if you concentrate that, you can get those really great concentrated yields. And it's almost like building a raised bed in reverse, kind of in a little bit of a pit. Absolutely. And you know, one of the, the ways, so sometimes people look down on hand labor because, you know, maybe inefficient or whatnot, but it's, if it's what you have access to, and in some ways, you know, being very accurate and precise about opening these pits up through hand labor um, makes it far more environmentally sustainable as well in the long term, and you get, you know, concentrated yields. Uh, one other thing that they're starting to do in conjunction with this, and actually Echo Asia uh, is partnering with the International Biochar Initiative in May to do a biochar week-long workshop is um, creating biochar and not just using compost, but making biochar with the compost because we've, we've seen, there's been research that shows the tremendous potential for biochar to um, increase the fungal and microbial populations of your soil to regenerate soil health hold moisture, hold nutrients, release those appropriately to the plants as well. So there's an idea of kind of the synergies that can develop between different techniques and, um, yeah, doing what's appropriate, you know, in terms of helping our partners choose the options that work best for them. And I think that's one thing that we like to talk about is that agriculture is so complex. It varies. It varies from not only field to field and continent to continent, but it varies even within your own field sometimes with your microclimates and your differences in soil types. And it varies, you know, if you are growing a very diverse cropping system, you might have a tree that has a very different um, microclimate underneath of it than just five feet away in the full sun. So we like to talk about strategies and options. We don't, we don't claim that they're silver bullets. We know that they're not... Um, We talk about providing and helping people. We help curate strategies for our network that might work based on other networks members' experiences in their particular context. And them trying them low risk first themselves, um, especially if we're working with extension agents or NGO workers that can try these options low risk in their context before rolling them out to farmers because farmers don't have um, a lot of risk appetite. They they just can't simply afford the risk. And um, yeah, just helping, we exist to help them be successful in their work with that. Awesome. Hello, dear listeners. 
As the green shoots of spring emerge, signaling planting season in full swing, isn't it the perfect time to bring new life onto the land? At shop.growingfarmers.com, a treasure trove awaits to transform even the most forgotten corner of your space into a vibrant oasis. Imagine lush elderberries and willows swaying in the breeze, or the sweet promise of homegrown strawberries and the hearty depth of rhubarb pie made from your harvest. Perhaps you've pondered over the joy of harvesting your own potatoes. Well, ponder no more. Our small business is dedicated to bringing you an exceptional variety of plant material to make these dreams a reality. We're shipping daily, ensuring that your planting ambitions are supported with timely and quality deliveries right to your doorstep. So if you've been eyeing that sunny spot by the fence or considering how to fill that quiet corner of your yard, look no further. Our perennial selections are not just plants. They're future harvests, memories, and the beginning of a more sustainable lifestyle right from your own land. Visit shopgrowingfarmers.com today and make the first step towards a greener, more fruitful farmstead or garden. We can't wait to grow with you. Let's go back to that biochar there. Talk a little bit about, because that's something that we've been very interested in as well. How are you having your farmers charge that? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, really interesting. One, one thing I like to say about Echo, so we, we're really a, you know, we're a conduit of these ideas to our diverse network. So, um, we're a, a technical agricultural networking and resourcing organization. So most we're, we're not directly implementing development projects per se. We work with farmers from time to time. Um, from our network, we've seen so many ways that they're charging their biochar. We've seen so many ways that network members and farmers are making biochar, you know, from Jolly Roger toplet updrafts to trying to ramp up commercial production to open, you know, trapezoidal troughs to biochar in pits as uh -huh. well um, and on the actual pyrolysis and char production. You know, from the network, we have seen people use all sorts, sorts of charging from mixing the biochar with the compost and letting it sit and keeping it okay. moist. Okay, yeah to uh, using bioliquid fertilizers that they've created on farm um, to human, human urine and charging uh -huh. biochar with that. Um, some, some farmers and partners, you know, they see biochar as a way to use synthetic fertilizers in a more um, effective way. So charging biochar with not only liquid synthetic fertilizers like urea, but also then adding compost or manure to it to get kind of a double boost, if you will. Um, so we've seen everything across the spectrum. And I think one of the neat things is that we work, you know, really through partnerships. So this workshop is going to explore a lot of those different techniques in Asia in conjunction with the International Biochar Initiative, which has done a lot of the research. It has its own network of biochar, you know, evangelists, if you will, and practitioners. So I'm looking forward just to seeing what the synergies are that come out of that in that region that can be shared across the world. And I think that's one of the neat things about ECHO is that our technical networking portal is called echocommunity.org, and it is... It's a network of 19,000 individuals and organizations around the world. I mean, we have, we have, we have people working as uh, organic, organic farmers, you know, with CSAs in North America, all the way to huge NGOs like World Vision or Save the Children, agricultural specialists using Echo Community, sharing their ideas, their challenges, their successes. Um, to local farmers using the local language version of, of Echo Community. So one of the things that's neat about Echo is we're able to, based on this huge network around the world, literally we're being accessed by 190 countries a month on echocommunity.org, but we're able to amplify and share across this network. So, you know, whatever, whatever learnings that we learn from the Asia Biochar Workshop, we'll be able to share those um, as, as options for farmers, like maybe your network would be mm -hmm. interested in here in North America because so many fundamental problems with, with our current industrialized, globalized agriculture system. And, you know, I think one thing is that it's good for ag workers and farmers to know that they're not alone and, um, and that there's solidarity and, and camaraderie among this network that's really trying to make a difference in the lives of smallholders, whether it's through how do, you, you, how do you make biochar and use it in North America or Sri Lanka and looking for some of those commonalities that, that can really help one another out. Mm, absolutely. 
Let's talk about that aspect of sustainability because you did mention conventional fertilizers. I'm assuming there's a lot of places some of these farmers are getting information from. How do you kind of like weed out and try to kind of like guide folks on on these? Where where does that kind of like line of what's the data to give them? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, Part of it is based on the 43 years of, of Echo's history, knowing our network well. I think you know, going back to the demographics of our farmers, for sure, and not not our farmers, that's kind of per- pejorative, but, you know, the farmers that our network are are helping and, and serving, or farmers themselves, um, a big one is just access. What do these farmers have access to? Many don't have access to credit, and maybe that's mm-hmm. not a bad thing, you know, because there's a huge debt cycle often associated with um overuse of pesticides and fertilizers in that treadmill. So the demographics and using the lens of what do the farmers in our network or our networks are working with, what do they have access to? And so Mm. um, that's one of the lenses. Another one is what is in the best interest of farmers and what information really is truly towards a sustainable model of agriculture? So, um, you know, we don't say all fertilizers and synthetic pesticides are bad, but we do say, what can you use, you know, in integrated pest management, what's a, what's a starting point for that? And where does judicious use of biologicals and pesticides and organic pesticides or um, farm created pesticides, where do those come into play? So we are creating a lot of the information ourselves and validating it through our own research and our own network, but we're also looking for other network members' lived experiences and successes. So, you know, thankfully the United States has a great extension services branch, and we learn a lot from them, and we share a lot of their stuff. FAO has a very rich history and tradition of technical resources that really are towards sustainable um, and, and we look forward to sharing those, and we share a lot of our network members as well. But always through the lens of, you know, what are best practices in sustainable agriculture? Um, so one would be if you're able to create your own low-cost fertilizers on farm through synergies and recycling and nutrients, then that's a great starting point. If you're able to um, use integrated pest management, then what do you have available locally? How do you scout? And so there's a there's a a strong capacity strengthening aspect to, to those types of approaches that we take based on where mm. our, our network members are and where they're coming from. Gotcha. Okay. What would you say has been the biggest kind of aha moment since you've been now in um, leadership at Echo? You know, I think I think one of them, looking back, just at, at the rich history of Echo, I like to say that, say that we stand on the shoulders of giants, not only, you know, the founders and the previous leadership and staff of Echo, but also our network and just this incredible network where we've just moved out of a year-long strategic planning uh, year to create our strategic framework for the next five years. And, you know, some of, so taking a step back with data and saying, and asking ourselves, what are Echo's core attributes? What are we best known for? And a couple of things emerged. One was that we really work through a network. We're not a direct implementing relief and development organization. We're not a mission sending agency. We're a faith-based organization, but we work with everybody. We love this incredible diversity of our network, you know, from, it's incredible at one of our, you know, at our, our events that we can get agricultural missionaries around the same table as uh, government officials, as multilateral FAO workers, as big NGO workers, grassroots organizations, permaculturalists, hippies, um, local leaders, you name it. They're all invited and encouraged to come to ECHO events. So that's one thing, is that our network is diverse and it's synergizing. Another one is just that our regional impact center model is pretty phenomenal. It allows us to have local teams working regionally to keep a pulse on where agriculture is and where it's going and what the needs of farmers is now and in the future, but also what those what those network members and farmers are learning to give them dignity and the ability to share what they're learning. And so trying to recapture some of the dignity of farming 
um, that we've really lost in a large in a large measure around the world. And so that's been exciting. Um, another one is just the need for and desirability of local seed banks. And we've learned a mm. lot in 40 years of what do low cost seed banks look like in Burkina Faso or Mali or Botswana, Nepal, Thailand. They're all going to look different, but what are some of those best practices? Because seed banks you know, have so much to offer in terms of food security, cultural preservation, um, biodiversity preservation, combating climate change through adaptation. Um, they're so important. So those are going to be a big part of our next strategic plan. And it, it gets me excited because I think ECHO has a lot to offer the world in terms of uh, sharing what we've learned, all the, the lumps and bumps and bruises of what we've learned about it to help others be be effective in that. Um, so that's those those three things have been really encouraging and mm -hmm. our new strategic framework really echoes on that. And, you know, one other thing is network members really desire to be connected with each other. So we're going to do a lot more in terms of how do we use tech well? That's at appropriate levels to help network members, whether you're a farmer in the outer reaches of Zimbabwe. How do you connect that farmer to someone with learned experience and lived experience anywhere else around the world because we all have something to share and synergize. Mm, absolutely. And I, you mentioned the echocommunity.org, which is really cool because I think anyone can join and just go on and post questions and it's got a global audience for answers, correct? That's absolutely right. We translate into something like 17 languages. We have a mobile version of that as well. And it's chock full of ideas and information, 42 years of published history. Not, not, there are some research publications, but there's also very accessible, farmer accessible, network accessible, extension agent accessible publications. Um, if you can dream it up, it's probably on Echo Community with, with echoes from our network and validated information there. We also have upcoming events on Echo Community. It's also filled with uh, conversations. So we have a special place where ECHO members actually share either what they're struggling with or need help finding answers to. And it, we allow, you know, we, we have a place where a forum where other community members chime in and give ideas, or they can share successes as well and said, hey, I just came across this incredible idea. It's working here. You might try it in your context as well. Um, so echocommunity.org is our networking platform. Echonet.org is our organizational landing page. So that gives an idea about who we are as an organization, where we're going. Um, we are supported completely by uh, generous individual donors. We have some, some foundation donors. Um, like I mentioned, we're a faith-based organization. We have churches that, that support us, but we have a tremendous number and a really diversity of individual donors that uh, can give monthly, can give a one-time gift, can give cryptocurrency, uh, artwork, you know, you name it, we, uh, yeah. we'll take it, you know, to help keep everything going. And, and really that frees us up for our incredible staff of about 100 people working around the globe, on the ground, in some of the most difficult places to keep doing and, and to be 100% focused on the mission of, of ECHO. Mm, absolutely. And they can find you on Instagram and Facebook, both that they search for, well, it's Echo Fights Hunger, correct? Echo Fights Hunger is our, ta our hashtag. Yes, they can find us there. And on LinkedIn at Echo-International um, is our LinkedIn handle as well. Gotcha. Okay. So then anything else you'd like to share with us, be our audience, before we go? Just that it's wonderful um, being able to, to meet and chat and, you know, one of the things we've done is in the past year reimagined re this campus. So I'm sitting in, in Fort Myers right now at our, our campus. Um, you know, it's, it's now the technical team in campus has a director just as the other teams around the world do. So this is now the ECHO North America Impact Center. We also have the global support team here, of which I'm a part of, to support all the technical operations strategically and administratively, but the team here in Fort Myers, Florida, um, you know, they have three audiences. One audience is those English speakers and internationals either based or headquartered out of North America, um, working internationally around the world to fight hunger and improve lives. The second one are those who are aspirational to do so. So students and 
um, those who might end up internationally, maybe you're a Peace Corps volunteer or thinking about becoming that, that's one of their audience. The other one is anyone working in food security here in North America, our local organizations and North American organizations, churches doing urban gardening, individuals doing CSAs and trying to make a difference here. Uh, this campus is for you and they are gung-ho on offering more hands-on trainings using this incredible campus, tours, answering your questions, networking you together. We have a Centropic Agriculture week-long class coming up in April, we have an introduction to tropical agriculture development coming up in April here on this campus. We've got housing and training facilities for you, so you are welcome to, to come to one of those, and you'll find out more on echocommunity.org about those. Very cool. And um, folks can visit the campus, is that correct? Absolutely. We offer public tours Tuesday through Saturday. Uh, you can find out more about that on either Google Maps, searching for Echo Global Farm on that, or echonet.org. But yeah, we have tours, we have trainings, we have work team and volunteer opportunities. Um, so it's always a hubbub of activity, and it's just a great way to see what tropical, subtropical agriculture around the world looks like, can look like, and to see some of those promising uh, strategies I, I shared about just a little bit ago. Mm, absolutely. And you guys have different like ecosystems set up there as well. We do. We have about eight simulated agro ecosystems from around the world, from a semi-arid zone to a tropical rainforest, urban garden. Um, we have a seed bank. We also do a lot in appropriate technology, which is a separate tour. But the idea of how do you use what you have to make what you need. So a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of farmers and, and tinkerers, engineers, um, you can see appropriate um, improved cook stoves, solar cookers, biogas digesters, threshers, seed bank technologies, building technologies all here on our campus. Very cool. Well, Abram, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today and uh, about your mission. It's, it's awesome and can't wait to uh, get down there myself. Michael, thank you so much. This has been wonderful and I look forward to uh, interacting with, with your audience and, and your network. So thanks so much for hosting me. Absolutely. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer Podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.